Hello, this is AP Government Unit 5, and it, political participation. This might take two videos, we'll see, but let's get started. I think this is a pretty easy unit, but let's get started. Okay, write this down. What are linkage institutions? Linkage institutions are groups such as political parties, the press, and interest groups. And that's what we're going to be talking about in Unit 5. How do these three examples link the people to the government? So think about it. You're sitting there on your front porch, and you want to um, express your opinion to somebody in power. How would you do that? Well, you could go through a political party. You could write a letter to the press. You could donate money to an interest group. You know, all of those ways are ways that you could communicate with the government and vice versa. These are also ways for the government to communicate with you. Okay, so no need to get into more detail because we're going to that's what this whole chapter is about. Okay, so let's start with political parties. All right, so. Think in your head, what are the two major political parties, and can you think of the third parties, the minor parties? What is a political party? Okay, you can write this down or not, but basically it's a group with similar ideology, or it's a coalition um, who wants control of the government. Now, that sounds bad, but let's be honest. I mean, if you want to make a change in this country, you need to take control of the government. OK, it, it sounds worse than it is. And I don't mean like, like January 6th. Style, OK, I mean, like you means you win elections fair and square. OK. And keep in mind something about political parties. They are private organizations. They political parties are not mentioned in the Constitution. OK, but they are a fundamental part of our governmental system. OK, keep in mind that Democrats tend to be on the left and Republicans tend to be on the right. We also say that Democrats are liberal and Republicans are conservative. OK, and uh, here's a, now here's something that you may not know. For whatever reason, Republicans are represented by an elephant, and Democrats are represented by a donkey, okay? For whatever reason, I think it goes back to a Thomas Nass cartoon back in the 1800s, but there's no real legitimate reason for that, okay? Um, and, of course, this cartoon is talking about how both parties could be blamed for the government shutting down. Um, but again, it, unless there's a specific incident, I don't need to comment on it. Okay. And so, yeah, and sometimes the political parties don't like each other too well. You know, and sometimes we vote for a candidate simply because they're not the other candidate. For example, there's a lot of Republicans who don't like Trump. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll vote Democrat, but, but it might, um, there's a lot of Democrats in 2016, there a lot of Democrats did not like Hillary Clinton. And that's why while she won the popular vote, she did not win the presidency. We'll talk more about that in a second. Okay. So, uh, there's the elephant and the donkey. Okay. So one thing I need you to understand is political parties change over time, okay? Um, there's something called a critical election that bring about something called realignment. Now, you need to write realignment down. Uh, we'll get that in the next slide. So a critical election, and I don't know if this is true, but it's here, 1932 election of Franklin Roosevelt, New Deal brought African Americans to the Democratic Party because African Americans voted Republican because, remember, Lincoln freed the slaves. 
Now, I don't know if this is true because you know what? Everybody voted for FDR in 1932. So I don't know if this is a good example, but you need to be aware of it in case the college board throws that at you. I just don't think it's true. Everybody voted for FDR. <laughs> you know, it was like a landslide election. Another example of a realignment, a critical period, is when the Southern racists left the Democratic Party and started to vote for Republicans back in the 1960s. It all happened with the Civil Rights Act of 64, when Lyndon Johnson was president. That was a major realignment. And then in 94, um, the white working class men left the Democratic Party and started voting Republican. Um, you know, because the Democrats used to be the party of labor unions and and uh, the working man, and Republicans used to be the party of Wall Street and suit-wearing business types, and it's just not like that anymore. Sorry for babbling. Moving right along. Okay, so and which of the following occurs after a critical election occurs? So maybe you should have written down. Um, the answer? Um, the answer is B, party realignment. That's when a party changes its stance on a lot of major issues and people change the way they vote. Okay? So, yeah, you need to, I need to, you need to know about realignment. Okay. All right. Redistricting, that's when they redraw the, the congressional district lines every 10 years. That's something else. Okay. Um, by the way, the Democratic Party is called the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, I think what it's called, and then the Republican National Committee. And every four years, they have a convention or a major convention. And these conventions are really pep rallies. They get a lot of free airtime, so it helps their cause. And the party delegates draft a platform. That's when they list what they want to achieve. You know, the Democrats say, this is what we want, and this is what we believe, and these are our goals. And the Republicans usually do the same. And that's also when they officially nominate the candidate for president and vice president. Usually it's decided well before then. This is usually in the summer before the November election every four years. Usually it's fairly well decided a few months before, but still. But many years it's not. Okay. This is kind of outdated, but, you know, I mean, whoever made this PowerPoint made it in 2018, but I've made some changes to it. Okay, uh, so the Republicans have a convention. The Democrats have a convention every four years. It's like a big it's it is like a pep rally, but it's also where they nominate who's going to be president. They they count the ballots. That's this is just to see who's going to run. This isn't the election. It's. OK, now let's talk about third parties. And I might have mentioned it in another unit, but I want you to know that third parties are at a major disadvantage. OK, um, they just now why are they at a disadvantage? There's a few reasons. But one thing that these are the disadvantages right here, we have a winner take all system. Um, there's just never enough money for third parties. Ballot access. Some states make it really hard to be on the ballot. So you may go in in some states and you only see Democrats and Republicans, and you won't even see a third party candidate. And the, when we talk about the major presidential debates, the third parties aren't, aren't allowed. So, yeah, they don't have the numbers, but it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. They don't have the numbers because you're not letting them on stage. So, yeah, it is kind of an exclusive club. Democrats and Republicans do what they can to keep out third parties. But I want you to understand um, third parties do bring important issues to the public. And what they try to do, third parties, 
is they try to get the other two parties to adopt their stuff. Okay, they're not trying to win. Third parties are not trying to win. They're not idiots. They're not going to win. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to get the Democrats and Republicans to take on some of their issues. Okay, notice here it says the role of spoiler. I'll explain what that means. They, they, they can really spoil elections. I'll explain what I mean by that. So let me give you an example of spoiling an election. In the year 2000, it was a very close election between George W. Bush and Al Gore. Al Gore was the Democrat. Bush was the Republican. Now, I want you to know that Al Gore is very famous for being very environmental, you know, wanting clean air, cleaning up the rivers and all that. Al Gore is famous for that. And then you've got the Green Party. Ralph Nader of the Green Party. Green Party is an environmental party. That's all they care about is the environment. Okay? Clean air, clean water, you know, all that stuff. Now, look at the difference between Bush and Gore in the state of Florida. It's what, 800 votes, 700 votes? 540, actually, I think. So 540 votes, that's the difference, right? Or something like that. But look at how many votes Ralph Nader had. Now, these are all environmentalists. So if, if, if Ralph Nader didn't vote, didn't run for this election, who do you think these environmentalists would have voted for? They would have clearly have voted for Al Gore, or they wouldn't have voted at all. And then Al Gore would have been president in the, in the 2000 election. He would have been president in the early 2000s, not George W. Bush. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that the Green Party stole this election from Al Gore, in my opinion. That's an opinion. Now, if you go up to people in the Green Party and say, you stole the election from the Democrats. They will be mad at you, and they will tell you otherwise. Okay, so don't go up to Green Party and people and tell them that because they will get mad at you. Then in 2016, it happened again. Uh, Trump won in 16, right? Now check it out. Look at these three states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. Trump won Pennsylvania by 46,700 votes. That's not a lot. There's millions of people in Pennsylvania. How many votes did Stein get? More than that. Now, these Stein votes would have gone to Hillary Clinton, most likely. You don't believe me that Stein stole the election from Hillary Clinton? Well, look at this. Trump won Wisconsin by 22,000, but look at how many votes Stein got. And look at this, Michigan. Trump won Michigan by 11,000 votes. Stein won it by over 51,000 votes. The Green Party stole this election from Hillary Clinton. That's my opinion. You can take what you want with that, but they play the role of the spoiler, okay? All right, look at this question. I don't want to read it to you. The answer is B. Them Democrats and Republicans, they are all the same. That's what a lot of um, that's what a lot of third party people say. They're all the same. There's no difference. And maybe they got a point. To them, there is no difference. To me, there's a big difference. Okay. All right, write this down. So an incumbent is somebody who's already in office and they are running for re-election. And it turns out that most of the time they win. 90% of incumbents are reelected. And that's true with presidency too. Most presidents win re-election. Sorry, Trump, but it's true. You know, why these advantages? Money, name recognition, media exposure. Okay. And you can't say, well, they've never done it before. They don't have experience. Well, if they're running, they've had four years of experience. Okay. All right. So, by the way, and this is in the Constitution, the presidential election is on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November 
every four years. Okay, so usually around November 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, you know, something like that. And the president runs every four years, but in the other even number of years, there are what's called midterm elections. Midterm elections means that the president is not running. And voter turnout is lower in midterm elections for whatever reason, because of media exposure and people feel like their vote is more important when the president's running. 2018 had a midterm election. 2022 had a midterm election. 2022. 2020 was the presidential election. That's when Biden beat Trump. Incumbents usually win. I'm not asking you to write all this down. I mean, okay. How In the House of Representatives, incumbents win 90% of the time. That's a lot. Why do they win? Name recognition, money, and presence. Okay. Now, here's something else. This is interesting. In midterm elections, the president's party tends to lose seats in Congress. I don't know why, but it's true. I'll prove it to you. Look at this. So Trump was a Republican, and Republicans lost 26 seats in the House of Representatives. Now, Republicans gained three in the Senate, but that's rare. Obama's a Democrat. Democrats lost 13 seats in the House. They lost six seats in the Senate. Look at this. Obama in 2010, Democrats lost 63 houses in the Senate and nine Senate seats. The Republicans just murdered the Democrats that year. So it is rare. You look at all the green. It's rare for a president's party to gain seats in the midterm elections. But it happens, but it's rare. In 2022, everyone was shocked that Republicans did gain a few seats in the House, but they lost one Senate seat. We were expecting the Republicans to win because, remember, Biden is a Democrat, and we expect that when the president is a Democrat, for Democrats to lose seats in the House. It happens all the time, but that didn't happen, maybe because of the abortion issue. I don't know. Okay, so we're talking about political parties. What do, um, what do candidates and political parties do? Most of the time spent competing for independent voters. I don't know about that, but it does make sense to try to go for people who are, who, whose mind can be changed. I still don't agree with that because candidates spend a lot of time trying to mobilize their own voters to give them something to be excited about. That's why Democrats are always talking about health care and abortion. It gets the Democrats excited. Republicans are always talking about do something bad to trans people. That's how you get Republicans excited. Okay, I hope that's not offensive. I'm just trying to tell you what I think, uh, at least based on what I've seen. There is, a, there is something going on in the last 100 years or so, candidate-centered campaigns. They focus more on the person running. In the old days, it used to be vote Democrats, vote Republican. But, but, ever, but since Eisenhower, maybe, or even earlier than that, it was more about vote for this guy because this guy is cool. Eisenhower was, you know, he was a general during World War II, so everybody's like, vote Eisenhower. It doesn't matter what party he is, okay? So remember that candidate-centered campaigns that focuses on the candidate more than the actual political party, okay? Okay, you need to write these down. You can put them on the same note card, but you need to write these down and have them memorized. Okay, so rational choice voters. 
I'm going to vote for this guy because he's going to cut my taxes. I'm going to vote for this guy because he's going to give us free community college. Either way, I'm, I know I'm mocking people. I don't mean to, but I'm just saying that if you vote for your own personal interest, you, you are a rational choice voter. Now, part, let's just skip the party line, get it out of the way. Party line voters are people who will vote Democrat no matter what and will vote Republican no matter what. In Texas, we have something called the yellow dog Democrat. It goes, with, it goes with this. It says, I'd vote for a yellow dog if he were a Democrat. You know, <laughs> um, there's a lot of party line voters out there. Not all, of, not everyone's a party line voter, but um, there are plenty of them. Okay, now think of the word retro. What does it mean when we say, ooh, that's retro? It means the past. Retrospective voters judge a candidate based on their past actions. Oh, this guy did a good job, so I'm going to vote for this guy. And then there's perspective voting. Perspective, pro, forward. That's when you say, I'm, I'm going to vote for this guy because he's going to do a good job. That's perspective voting. Future. So think pro, forward, retro, backward. Okay. Also, um, I'm not sure what to say about it, but I did see a, a, a paragraph on College Board of this old question, it, and this lady was talking about micro-targeting. Um, guys, they can use the internet and they can find out, they can buy your data from places like Google and Amazon, and, and they sell your data to like political parties and campaigns. And everybody knows if you've donated to a campaign, everybody knows like, you know, like, or, you know, they know a lot about you based on data. And I mean, like, and, and that's why when you get a knock on your door, they're not trying to convince you to vote for somebody. They're saying, I know that you registered to vote for the Democrats last year. We just wanted to see if you're going to vote this year. All right. You know, because they know who you're going to vote for. Probably they just they come, they knock on your door to try to see you know, if they can make sure that you get out and go vote. So it's not really trying to change your mind on anything. They're just trying to get you to get out and actually vote. OK, but micro targeting, that's like they they used to like say this county voted for this candidate. Now it's like down to the street level. That's micro targeting. Okay. okay, I want to talk to you about the primary. Both parties, they can't just let everybody run. You know, if you have too many people running, it's going to take away from, it's going to, you know, then that means, you know, a divided house can't take on the other party. So if you got like one Democrat and five Republicans, then the Democrat's going to win every time. So primaries are to narrow down who's going to run. So the Democrats, they're going to choose one candidate to run, and the Republicans are going to choose one candidate to run. And then they'll throw all their money at one candidate. And then... That's the primary. You, it happens in the spring of an election year. And then by summer, they know who won the primary and who's actually going to run. And that's true for presidency. It's true for governor. It's true for Senate. Primaries are secret voting. So nobody knows who you're voting for. And there's something called a closed primary and an open primary. You, I have seen questions on this, so you may want to write it down. An open primary is when you could just show up the day of the primary and go vote for whatever party you want. So if I'm a Democrat and I want to go vote for Trump or against Trump, I can do that in an open primary. But I can't do that in a closed primary. Okay. 
Um, Democrats have talked about going to the Republican primaries and voting for Trump because Democrats think that we can beat Trump. And that's kind of dangerous, but, um, but that has been talked about. Okay. So in 2016, look at all these Republicans running for presidency. Okay. And then in 2020, these Democrats ran for the primary to, if Biden ended up winning that primary, but they actually duped it out for a while. Okay. So caucuses are more like an open town hall kind of thing where you vote out loud, not in secret, and you have this open debate. It, it works really well in very small towns, and they sit around and they talk about it. Like, for example, in 2024, they're going to talk about something like, why would we vote for Trump when he can only be president for four years? But if we vote for this other guy and he wins, he can actually run for two terms. You know, they're going to bring that up if Trump wins, because Trump can only serve for one term because of the 22nd Amendment limits the president to two terms. They're going to have that debate. Okay. So you win a state primary, you win all their delegates, winner-take-all system. At the convention, and that's what these pictures are, at the convention, they count up all the, the delegates' votes, and, and they, do, they announce it publicly, and it's just a big old pep rally. Both parties do it. And then they add them up, and whatever candidate gets the most votes is the one candidate that will run in the major general election. So I don't really know what these numbers are, but these are the each. This is the Republican Party, um, and these are all the delegates that each state sends to the convention. <clears throat> and this is for the Democratic Party. That's okay. See, Sanders did okay, but Clinton beat Sanders in 2016. Okay. All right. Read that. The answer is retrospective voting because you're judging Hoffman based on the past, retro past. Okay, read that. All right, the answer is A, incumbency. Incumbents in the House win 90% of time, 90% of the time. All right, the general election. So the two candidates and their vice presidents go around the country, and they focus on swing states, and they focus on big states. because So... Now, back in 2016, these were the swing states, but that's changed a little bit since then. But these states are swing states. And some people criticize it, saying that y'all ignore all the states that aren't swing states. Like, no candidate goes to California, even though it's big. Why? Because the Democrats are going to win it no matter what. Some years, Texas is considered a swing state, but... I think um, I don't I don't know if Texas is going to be considered a swing state anymore. Democrats almost took it a few times, but um, not recently. So there's a debate. And you need to understand the electoral college system. I guess I need to go to a certain website. Um, let me show you. It's called 270 to win. Why? Because you need 270 electoral points to win the presidency. Okay. So check out this map. Blue means Democrat. Red means Republican. Okay. So this is how it works, basically. So think about Texas. You think you think Biden's going to win Texas? Probably not. So let's make Texas red. 
Boom. What about Florida? You think Biden's going to win Florida? Probably not. Boom. Now, what about Nevada? Well, in 2020, Biden won Nevada. So let's make it blue. In Arizona, Biden won Arizona. Georgia, believe it or not, Biden won Georgia by like 10, 11,000 votes. North Carolina, I'm not sure who won that one, but Pennsylvania, Biden won Pennsylvania. Look, he's almost got enough to win. Ohio, Trump won Ohio. Michigan, Detroit, boom, that's it. Biden won. Biden also won Wisconsin, Minnesota. I, I think Trump won Iowa. I don't know about North Carolina. I'm going to make it red. Um, I'm not so sure about them. But the point is, is that what happens is, is that each state has a certain amount of points based on the population. California and Texas have the most because they have the most population. Okay. Um, but that doesn't mean that's where the candidates go to. They go to the swing states like Georgia, Arizona, Nevada, Pennsylvania. Trump actually won Pennsylvania in 2016, like I mentioned before. Okay. And, and Florida has been reliably Republican in the last few years. Now, some of y'all are thinking, okay, why don't we just say the candidate who wins the most votes wins? Because that's not how it is. Hillary Clinton won in 2016 by 3 million votes, but she still lost the Electoral College. Um, this is why. Because we are a nation of states, and if we just go to popular vote, then the candidates will just go to the cities, and they will never, ever go to Iowa or Missouri. Uh, they will just, they already do neglect the countryside, but at least um, some of the smaller states get some attention this way. Um, it's just a different way of doing it. But yeah, the smaller states do have an advantage with this electoral college system. If you take away the electoral college and you just do it based on popular vote, then that means the candidates will only campaign in cities and just ignore the country. It's true. So that's what we mean by the electoral college system. There are 538 electors, but you need 270 to win. If there's if no one reaches 270, then the House of Representatives decides. Most states are winner take all. So if you win Texas by th five votes, then you get all of the Electoral College points. That hasn't happened. But sometimes the candidate who wins does not win the popular vote. It's happened a few times. Okay. So here are the results of the 2020 election. So, yeah, Trump did win North Carolina. Okay. Trump won Texas. Trump won Florida. Democrats won Georgia, Virginia, Pennsylvania. Democrats usually win this area, the Northeast, and they always win the West Coast. It's actually nicknamed the Left Coast. Colorado's been blue recently. Okay. All right, moving right along. All right, I'm not going to stay here. So you start with the primaries and caucuses. Then you move to the convention, and then you move to the general election, and then you got to win the electoral college. Okay. All right. Read that. Okay. So what are you going to do first? You're going to you're gonna you're going to go to early caucus states and early primary states 
and just start hanging out there and fundraising and talking to the people. Okay, that's what you do when you run for president. Late, in the last several years, it's always been Iowa and New Hampshire. But the Democrats actually are changing it. Now they're going to start in South Carolina. Strange, but that's what they're going to do. All right. Which of the following scenarios best represents an example of party line voting? All right. The answer is that. Okay. Republicans voting for only Republicans and Democrats voting for only Democrats. All right, which of the following best explains how parties link citizens to the electoral process? This one's a little tricky. Make sure that there's a really clear link. Okay, this is a tough one, but the answer is... Honestly, I'm not even sure, honestly. Okay, all right, do this question. The answer is a closed primary. So, um, you know, you have to, um, you have to say, I'm a Republican, so I'm going to vote in this closed Republican primary. You have to identify which party you are. Okay, all right. Which of the following is true of the Electoral College system? The answer is B. Yes, size isn't everything, but they did put competitive in there. Why would you go to a state that isn't competitive? Okay, Pennsylvania is competitive, so you're going to go there. Arizona is competitive. Are they a swing state? It's kind of the same thing, but not really. Okay, if you don't want to write this down, fine. Um, we teach this in the 11th grade, but you need to be aware of these amendments. And I have seen questions on both of these amendments. 15th Amendment, the right to vote shall not be denied on the basis of race. 17th Amendment, before the 17th Amendment, your state Congress voted for your United States Senator. But because of the 17th Amendment, now it's done through popular election. Okay, moving right along. Um, also, women's suffrage, 19th Amendment, 24th Amendment, outlawed the poll tax, 26th Amendment, lowered the voting age to 18. All of these expanded voting access. Okay, all right, moving right along. And this vote expanded voting right, voting access to the Voting Rights Act of 65. Notice LBJ and Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Abernathy. That was a big deal. That was a huge deal. Okay. All right. Answer this one. The answer is C. Lowered the voting age to 18. All right. That's enough for this lesson. I'll continue here on the next one.